it is now time for lecture 17. So do keep in mind, I'm not actually going to test you over any of the material in this lecture. It's just to give you a taste of graphs and some of the things that you can do with them to give you some motivation for the stuff that we've done with relations thus far. Okay, so recall that we have this Hayes diagram for the set one, two, three, four. This is called a graph. So what is a graph? Well, let's give a definition. A graph is an ordered pair V, E, where V and E are sets. The elements in V are called nodes or vertices, and the elements of E are called edges. So here, if I were to draw this out, these things here would be my nodes. And the lines connecting these will be my vertices. So notice here that depending on what operation I'm using to build the graph, the graph may or may not be directed. For instance, here, if I'm talking about subsets, I technically should have these little arrows here indicating that this is a subset of three, but three is not a subset of zero. So sometimes on graphs, you'll see little arrows, and those arrows indicate that the direction that you go along matters, and the, in particular, the arrows indicate what elements are related to the other elements. So again, I didn't do that here just because it ticks things. Okay, so what do graphs help me do? Well, in this case, if I'm talking about a set, the graphs show me all the possible subsets of a set. So in a field called linear al so in a field of mathematics called linear algebra, this can be very useful because it lets you quantify what say like subgroups and things like that are. So it can be useful from a theoretical mathematical perspective, but as we're going to see in this lecture, there are many, many, many real world applications of these graphs. So let's dive right into a bunch of applications. So for our first application, let's notice the internet is a collection of web pages. So for instance, this could be my internet. So here I have a Reddit homepage. From the home page, I could access our cats, our Ontario, our cute cats of Ontario, our dogs, or these mathematics memes. And from here, from our cats, I could say access cute cats of Ontario. Ontario might have this as a subreddit. Dogs might not have anything because they're not as cool as cats. And this mathematical memes might have this uh, cute cats in Ontario Ontario math memes page. So this may or may not be a directed graph depending on if I can go backwards. So what might I want to do with this internet? Well, since this is kind of a small enough of an internet, I could know where everything is. But if I'm talking about the real internet, it's really, really massive. So I might want to be able to search for something. So there's a few ways you can implement search engines by trying to search this graph. Uh, one way is to first turn this into a matrix. So this is the idea of an adjacency matrix. So here, assuming that these connections go both ways and that every page is connected to itself, then the adjacency matrix would be given by this. So what is this saying? Well, one, the matrix is actually the little table in here. It doesn't include these titles. I just did that so we can actually read it. In the adjacency matrix, I put a one whenever a particular web page is connected to another web page and a zero when they are not connected. So what this is saying is that web page A, Reddit homepage, is connected to itself and every page is connected to itself. And outside of this, this is saying that A is connected to B, so I put a one there, so from the homepage I can get to cats. But for instance, from the cats page, I can't get over here to Ontario page directly, so I have a zero. So now that I have this adjacency matrix, I can actually use it to build search engines to be able to search this uh, graph. So in particular, if I was say interested in wanting to know what page has the most other pages linked to it, that might be a metric of a good page because hey, the other pages are linking to it. Uh, so, so I could actually compute that via the adjacency matrix. Uh, to do that, it's something you don't need for this course but you compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you find the eigenvector that has the largest eigenvalue, and then each entry in that eigenvector will give you a number. And if you compare the elements of the eigenvector to find the element that has the largest number, the page that corresponds to that row in the vector is the one that's the most connected. 
So that's a very primitive search algorithm. Uh, other metrics, such as the page rank me method, uh, generally will produce better results. And that's what Google used for a really long time. So yeah, that's one application of graphs. The internet is a graph. Next, roads connect cities and intersections. That kind of sounds like a graph. So here's just kind of an example of where I grew up. In particular, I grew up in this town and my dad had land over here. Uh, so here you could view all of these intersections as nodes and you can view these roads as two-way uh, connections between these nodes. So one thing I conceivably might care about is how do I go from one location to another location in the fastest time or maybe the least distance? Those aren't necessarily the same thing. And the answer to that is you can apply various algorithms to this graph to try to compute that. Uh, there's a notoriously hard problem called the traveling salesman problem. For instance, say if I want to go to six different locations on here, what's the path that I should take that will take me to all of those six locations in say the least time or the least distance? So that can be a pretty difficult problem to solve, but using your graph can kind of help you along the way to solving it. And in particular, just the roads themselves along with these intersections form a graph. Now, in this case, unlike in the previous case, here I might say cats might not connect to the homepage. Here, these roads do connect, so this would be a bi-directional graph. I can go from here to here or from here to here. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper and more bio biological. Your brain is a collection of connected neurons. Right? We have some neurons and we have some axons that connect them and they send signals amongst each other. Well, that's a graph. And in particular, that's a graph that we can find very useful, not just in your own brain working, but we can use AIs. But we can use it to develop AI. So in particular, to make an AI, one way of doing this is to simulate a neural network. So how does this work? How is this a graph? Well, you can kind of clearly see that it would be a graph. graph but what if we wanted to make a computer play any Mario level? Well, to do this, we'd need to build some type of AI. And to do that, we could do something like use Mar.io. So credit for this comes from here. I completely stole this from a YouTube video. I took the picture from there. But what's happening here? Well, here I have the screen. And on the screen, as we see it, there's different objects. So there's kind of a, oops, there's kind of a grid sitting here. So that's a bit more clear. So there's a grid kind of like here and in each one of these squares there's little blocks. So what this square is doing is this is what I'm feeding into my AI brain. So basically the white squares are the squares along here telling me there's spots where Mario can step. These black squares are indicating these bad guys here that I don't want to step on and this is kind of off the screen here. And then what happens is I take this as an input. I have some other nodes in this middle over here. So it's not necessarily the clearest from this picture, but I have some other nodes sitting here like this. These different inputs connect to these nodes. It might look something like this, where it does its little brain neuron connecting stuff in the middle somehow. And then at the end, these ultimately connect over to these inputs. So for this particular version of Mario, these are the buttons I can click. So what I can then do, well, this is very clearly a graph, right? But what I can then do is I can change the relative strength of these neurons. So for instance, say this connection here might not be useful. Uh, it might not have been something that led me to winning the game. So I might want to weaken it. So I can use an evolution algorithm to basically add some kind of randomness between generations where I can change the relative strengths of these connections and eventually whatever works and whatever made me go the furthest will be the ones that kind of keep procreating and eventually I will be able to solve Mario. So yeah, AIs have a deep connection to neural networks and neural networks are a graph. So if you're interested in this, I highly suggest just watching the video. It's not terribly long and you might learn some stuff about AIs. So next in CS, we often want to minimize the amount of data required to express a message. So in particular, if I want to build a system such as ASCII, where I store all of the traditional characters that 
you have on a keyboard uh, and some that don't directly show up on the keyboard. Uh, I could do that by using terabytes and terabytes of data per each letter, but it's best if I minimize the data needed. Another example would be Morse code. So in Morse code, I have a series of dots and dashes to represent each letter. So for instance, E is just a dot and T is just a dash. But if I wanted to say, write J, that would be dot, dash, 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 or P would be dot, dash, dash, dot. So one way that I can kind of minimize the amount of data that's required to do something is to build a graph. So here, each dot and dash is kind of like a bit. It's either one or a zero. So you can see that the kind of minimal data that you can use to store all of these letters plus these numbers is the one, two, three, four, five levels. So here, do note that some of these aren't filled out. And that's just because within the system, it could be a bit more convenient to have all the numbers to be down here and the letters to be up here. So now this is very clearly a graph. Uh, one question I can ask is, why do I have these numbers and letters placed in very particular positions? Why is E here? Why is T here? And why is Q and Z way down here? Well, I can place the letters here by using a process called Huffman coding. Uh, and in particular, Huffman coding is a process whereby I take the most common letters or the most common things that I'm using or outcomes at the top and the least common at the bottom. E is the most common vowel in the English language, so I stick it here. T is the most common consonant, so I stick it there. And so on, I can just go kind of go down the list. This way, if I'm sending a message written in English, uh, on average, this minimizes the amount of stuff I have to send across the line. So on average, it minimizes it. It's not necessarily true for every message. For instance, if I have a message, for some reason, only use letters down here, uh, which notice there's no vowels down here, then using this system would not be the best way of encoding my message, but overall it works pretty well. So one more example, in CS we also use various data structures. Examples would be vectors. So recall, if you're not familiar, a vector is basically a list of, say, integers or whatever data structure you want. And here this list is kind of a linked list where everything knows what its next door neighbors are. This would be an example of a graph. Similarly, we can talk about strings, which are in some sense a kind of vector, but not really, uh, trees and binary decision diagrams. So all of these are examples of graphs. So explicitly, if I wanted to look at binary trees, they're going to be a graph of this form. So here I have some decision nodes that send it off over to here, some more decision nodes. And at the end, I have my outputs down here. So this is also a example of a binary decision diagram. So for any given point here, I make a choice of whether I go left or right, send it to something, send it to something over here, and it kind of collapsed down until eventually everything is a leaf. Now it can be shown that these binary decision diagrams lead to very efficient ways of storing information and very efficient ways of running a code. So in particular, so in particular, if at the bottom of say like these elements here, I put the things that are least likely to happen, and over here at the top, I put the things that are the most likely to happen, then on average, for the things that are more likely to happen, I end up going to them quickly, and the things that are less likely to happen take a little bit longer to go to, but I won't go down there as often. So it's kind of the same idea over here as Morse code, where I put the letters that are most common up here and the letters that are least common down here. But that's kind of outside the scope of graphs. The lesson here is all of these things that I've talked about are graphs, and they can be used to solve real world problems or to store data or to send messages very efficiently. Okay, so for your assigned reading, I want you to read pages 60 through 63. I'm not going to test you on it, but they do introduce some new uh, terminology, so it is good to read them. And we now have a meme for extra credit. So draw a graph connecting each utility to each house such that no edges cross. So if you can correctly solve this question, I'll give you 9,001 points. So here's the three houses and here's three utilities. And let's show you an example of what I mean. So to connect each one of these utilities to each house, I mean drawing something like this. Now they all have power. And now if I wanted to connect uh, gas or heat, 
whichever one this is supposed to represent. I want to connect it to say this house. Uh, I can go around this way to connect it, but I can't go through say here, or I can't do this because it would connect or because it would cross this power line here. So if you can manage to do this, I'll give you 9,001 extra credit points. Uh, do note that it is a meme extra credit problem. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you do manage to somehow solve it, uh, you can post it in public on Piazza. Okay, so that's it for this lecture and I will talk to you all later and have a wonderful weekend.